Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our latest webinar. Uh, I'm Alistair Dent. Joining me today, very special guest, uh, Chris Baxter from Baxter IP. Had a lot of interest in today's webinar and uh, got quite a number on uh, from right around the country and uh, some from international. We've um, selected intellectual property as the topic for today. And as I said, there's been a lot of interest in it. It's a, uh, it's a much misunderstood topic and uh, hoping we can get some clarity on that today from a real expert in the field in Chris. Um, and so Chris is gonna take us through um, a quick presentation covering off um, some key items around uh, what we mean by IP, um, where the value sits in IP and how we can actually unlock the enterprise value uh, in our businesses uh, through the leveraging uh, of IP. Uh, following that, we will um, change over to a, a Q&A session. So please have your, your questions um, ready. I throw them in the I throw them in the uh, in the Q and A chat, um, and we'll endeavour to get to them uh, at the end of this webinar. So, without further ado, can you please put your virtual hands together uh, for Chris Baxter? Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, Alistair. So, uh, yes, as Alistair let me said, uh, we'll be covering uh, a little bit of an overview of IP today, but then looking at where the value is in IP how to leverage it and have a bit of a Q and A uh, session at the end. So uh, I'll just move this out of the way. So uh, what is IP? Well, there's two broad categories of IP, statutory IP that's covered by federal legislation and non-statutory IP that's covered by common law. So uh, patents protect the way things work. They last for 20 years. And the two uh, broad criteria uh, for patentability, uh, the idea needs to be new and it needs to be inventive. Registered designs uh, last 10 years and uh, therefore you file registered designs to protect the uh, aesthetics of physical products. Uh, registered trademarks protect brands and the brand might be in the form uh, of, a, of a word, a slogan, a logo, and uh, trademarks last for as long as a business keeps using that word, logo, or slogan as a trademark. <clears throat> uh, copyright protects uh, uh, creative and literary works, uh, and it also uh, protects computer uh, computer source code, uh, and lasts for seventy years beyond the death of the author. And so. Some examples down here, we've got famous uh, uh, product of a famous Australian uh, innovator, ResMed. Uh, they make these, uh, these masks and each of these masks is protected by a number of patents and registered designs. And then we've got a uh, vehicle tire. The uh, tread pattern and the alloy design could both be uh, protected by uh, registered designs if, the, if their aesthetics are new. Uh, there may also be patents there. And then a brand you'll all recognize, the world's most valuable brand apparently. Uh, and then in terms of non, uh, IP goes a lot further than just the statutory forms of IP to really everything uh, your uh, uh, company uh, holds, holds dear and keeps secret. Uh, so that's trade secrets, that's know-how, it might be uh, your particular systems or processes. It might be in the um, population of your databases of customers, suppliers. Uh, and so that, that's also IP and a very important form of IP. Uh, you've also in Australia got unregistered trademarks. So whenever you start using a, uh, a logo uh, or a word as a brand, you actually do have some unregistered trademark rights under common law. Um, and that's uh, very heavily attached to uh, the goodwill of the business and the reputation of the business. Uh, uh, registered trademarks have a, a number of advantages. Uh, they're much easier to enforce, for example. Uh, but there are unregistered rights there. Um, 
in their absence. So um, now we know kind of what IP is and some of its different forms. Uh, where's the value of IP? It's in maintaining margin. And in a moment, we'll look at how patents, designs of trademarks help maintain margin. They protect the business. They apply pressure to competitors and they help a business, uh, can help a business uh, that's headed in that direction become trans transaction ready. So um, let's have a little bit of a think now around how patents and designs uh, maintain margin. So uh, you might have, uh, say you're in the business of, uh, here's an example from uh, recently. I just bought a, a kayak and I don't, you know, whilst it's easy for me to put it on the roof of my car, um, if I was, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe in 30 years uh, time, that might not be so easy. So I've got an invention that is a trailer for kayaks. And uh, what's uh, new about this invention is a one movement lever that uh, once the uh, kayak's placed on the trailer, secures the kayak to the trailer. So I've got a, say, a new and improved uh, kayak trailer. Now, um, I uh, bring that out to the market. Uh, the new feature uh, is the new product's well received and it's well received because of that feature. Um, sales are going well. I'm able to uh, sell it at a good price because it's uh, well differentiated from competitor products. Uh, now, say a competitor who likes to look at what I've done comes along and uh, starts uh, using a mechanism that is the same or very similar on their trailer. Well, what happens there uh, is uh, my product is no, long, uh, no longer as differentiated. So what, what happens in that type of situation? Well, and we'll look at two scenarios. So in the first scenario, your IP is protected. You've got, say, a granted patent on that uh, securing technology, in which case you can send a cease and desist letter, uh, have your attorney write it and send it to the uh, other side. And in our experience, in many cases, the infringement stops. Now, if it doesn't, uh, and uh, you know, obviously we're confident of our grounds before we send a letter like that, then, then we can take steps towards legal proceedings. Uh, and often uh, during mediation uh, processes in the lead up to legal proceedings, uh, the matter's dealt with or it may go to court. Um, but the bottom line is you can maintain your uh, product differentiation in market, uh, stop copying and maintain your, your, your margin. It's back to the drawing board for your competitor. If your IP is not protected, then obviously your situation is more difficult. Um, you may need to reduce the price of your uh, product over time to maintain sales volume. So uh, let's have a, also a quick think about how trademarks maintain margin. So uh, you've got a brand for a product, uh, you say Tiger Kayak, say, for example. Um, it's uh, recognized uh, in your industry uh, and by consumers, uh, and a competitor starts using a brand that's confusingly similar to yours, say Tiger with an A instead of an E, so T-I-G-A-R. So consumers start becoming confused about the origin of your uh, products and services, uh, or in this case, your kayak, uh, and uh, confused about the origin of uh, the competitor kayak. And that uncertainty slows purchasing decisions. Uh, consumers may also buy the inferior Tiger, with an A, uh, kayak, uh, and that may, and in their confusion, uh, with your brand, it may effectively tarnish your, uh, your brand's reputation. So it's, it's very important to have a uh, distinctive uh, trademark um, and uh, avoid, uh, take steps to avoid others using trademarks that are the same or confusingly similar. And that's, that's what a registered trademark allows you to do quite easily. So, uh, IP can also be used to protect the business uh, beyond just filings. And there's various search and, searches and investigations that uh, one can do. Uh, and if we just 
say, continue that tiger kayak analogy. Say uh, we've been selling our uh, trailer uh, here in Australia for some time. Uh, we now want to launch in the States. Uh, we haven't heard any anything from competitors uh, uh, around infringement of their IP in Australia, but maybe you know USA is much bigger market, and we just want to be sure that by launching our new uh, trailer design with its uh, new securing mechanism, we're not going to infringe anyone's patent over in the states. So that's what uh, you can use a freedom to operate search uh, to figure out to, uh, to get some clarity and confidence around on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction uh, basis, uh, whether there'll, there'll be problems with any third party IP uh, before you launch your product in another country. Uh, you might also uh, conduct a brand clearance search uh, on the Tiger uh, brand uh, in the States to see firstly, whether if you use that trademark in respect of the trailer, uh, whether there's likely uh, to be any, uh, any disputes uh, and also whether that trademark's registrable over there. Uh, then a few years later, you're successfully uh, selling your Tiger uh, trailers in the United States and you may conduct an evidence of use search to uh, identify whether anyone's infringing uh, your uh, trailer securing mechanisms. Finally, of course, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, there's uh, IP novelty searches that looks at the uh, uh, validity of a patent filing. So patents need to meet these two criteria. Uh, the idea needs to be new and it needs to not be obvious to someone who's uh, familiar with that field. And an IP novelty search looks at that newness criteria, is the idea new? IP can also be used to apply pressure to competitors uh, at different levels, uh, sort of at a basic level um, by uh, launching uh, products with new inventive and patent uh, protected features. Uh, it makes it harder for competitors uh, to compete because when they want to sort of uh, update their feature set to copy some of your features, uh, they can't do it um, or they do it uh, at risk of uh, getting a letter from you. So there are other uh, other strategies, um, particularly uh, larger companies using more sort of acrimonious uh, situations, such as ring fencing competitor products with IP. <coughs> That's where um, you look at a competitor product, you say, what are their next development steps? And you start filing patents on those development steps. And one tool that's been used extensively for this that um, uh, actually is uh, is the innovation patent system, which is being disbanded by the federal government in three weeks, um, incidentally. Uh, but it can, it can be, uh, the strategy can be done with standard patents as well. So <coughs> in the, excuse me, um, in the lead up to some sort of transaction, uh, whether it's a capital raise or a trade sale or, uh, some other sort of, uh, say, equity crystallization event, uh, it's important to have your IP in order and particularly have uh, the uh, title of IP ownership uh, uh, traced through written assignment from contractors to your IP holding entity or by employment agreements from your employees to, uh, again, your IP holding entity. It's nice to have the IP hived away in a holding entity where if something happens to your operational entity, you're, you're not, your IP is not at risk. Uh, and then <coughs> uh, IP, um, to the extent it's protecting sustainable market differentiation uh, and uh, protecting your new, new product features can help with business valuation. So uh, <coughs> how do we leverage IP to in a practical way to create enterprise value. So we'll have a look at three things. Uh, managing your IP, uh, using investigations to inform yourself about competitor IP and monetizing your IP. So, uh, can I just see if I can, um, in terms of managing your IP, 
Uh, it's important to know what you have first. And on the next slide, we'll look at a mini IP audit, the type of things that we look at uh, or look for uh, when we're conducting an audit for an SME. Um, educating uh, yourself and your team about IP. So it helps make sure um, you understand what you have and uh, doing the things that need to be done. Uh, capturing the IP, and I'll talk about some strategies to do that in a couple of slides. Of course, uh, once you've got something, uh, considering uh, making a filing around it uh, or how else you might protect it. And then uh, when you have um, filed IP, maintaining it. Excuse me. So uh, we discussed a few uh, sort of searches and investigations on the previous slide around that that you can use to inform yourself about competitor IP, such as freedom to operate searches and brand clearance searches. But you can also um, conduct much broader searches called landscape searches to see uh, who's filing uh, in in your field, like who, who's filing trailer patents around the world. Uh, where are they filing them? How strong are their patents? Um, who are their sort of entrenched players and who are the um, up and coming players? And it's, a, it's kind of a lot of insight you can get by just looking at uh, who's doing patent filings on what and when. Uh, some companies also look at when uh, key competitor IP is coming off patent. Um, it's the last 20 years, so it can, it can be a long way. or off designs, which last 10 years, and preparing their own product lineup. But of course, that's what generic uh, pharmaceutical companies do. So then uh, <clears throat> uh, monetizing our IP. Well, we're, IP uh, is effectively uh, monetized by protecting margin of your products. But in addition to that, um, uh, I came up with this uh, little silly example of uh, say you're in the business of uh, manufacturing uh, control systems for uh, electronically uh, or motorized pram say and uh, what you do is develop these electronic speed controllers um, for the um, to control the sort of uh, torque on the pram wheels now if you're only in, in interested in that sort of pram sector, uh, then, uh, but you've got a patent that has, potentially has applications to other sectors, such as this uh, silly example of uh, electrified uh, uh, kids BMW, uh, then uh, there's an opportunity there uh, to license uh, your, say, electronic speed control technology to people that are working in this other field. And so you can uh, establish additional licensing or royalty streams uh, through doing that. And uh, in another scenario, uh, and this is probably less likely in this particular example, um, say you're manufacturing selling prams, but only in Australia for some reason. Uh, now you might license uh, your aspects of your design or the ESC uh, technology to uh, a company in the States, for example. So, there's a lot of flexibility one has when one owns IP rights in terms of how they license them. So here's our uh, little mini IP audit. I'll try and get this thing out of the way. Yeah, I'll put it up here. So we normally start by looking at the corporate structure where, where um, they where a company is holding its IP or wants to hold its IP uh, and sort of relationships with different entities and stakeholders. Uh, we then uh, look at identifying the IP. So some of the things we've talked about already, but inventions, which can be protected by patents, brands, logos, taglines, trade dress, uh, which can be protected by trademarks, product designs that can be protected by registered designs, copyright, domains, uh, databases of customer supplier information, trade secrets, etc. cetera. Um, so that's always an interesting exercise, sort of digging in and seeing uh, what, a, what a company actually has. Uh, and then once we sort of know what's there, we want to check that the, uh, there's correct ownership flow from the original inventors or authors uh, 
of the inventions or designs um, uh, or people who are um, making the work in which the copyright subsists are uh, uh, back to the entity which, where we want the IP held. So we also look at um, IP related processes uh, around generation and promotion of IP uh, and what uh, IP protection is actually, actually in place and any uh, risks and any sort of gaps or opportunities for further protection and of course disputes what's uh, is there anything ongoing and what's potentially uh, over the horizon. Okay, so I just wanted to finish up uh, uh, on this presentation uh, with discussing IP capture. It's an area I'm particularly uh, passionate about because I've just seen over and over again, whether it's sort of back at my time working in-house at ResMed um, uh, or with all sorts of different uh, clients more recently, uh, the, the value in uh, setting aside some time and doing some proactive brainstorming into the future. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's a matter of uh, getting our, our brightest minds, our most creative uh, minds together uh, and uh, our most open-minded uh, souls uh, and uh, getting some time outside of the normal uh, humdrum of business operations uh, and, and really sort of uh, imagining what our product or service might look like in three years time, in five years time, <coughs> in eight years time, what's the, what's the ultimate version of our product or service actually look like? And because uh, you can be sure that over time, um, the market will move in those sorts of directions. And, it, and if you're looking that far forward, it's, a cent, it's normally a pretty blow, blue ocean in terms of IP. So the further you sort of look forward into the future, the normally the less sort of IP filings there are that have been filed that are relevant uh, to that, which means there's great opportunity for IP protection. Uh, so that's sort of uh, something proactively uh, you can uh, you can do, and then as you sort of uh, most companies are sort of coming up with a new uh, sort of the next iteration of their products, uh, the next feature, and that's sort of uh, often more red ocean in terms of IP or a mixed ocean uh, because uh, you know competitors are thinking about these types of features too. So patent lasts twenty years, right? It's a it's a long time. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, to the extent you expect uh, your business operation to uh, extend over those uh, periods of time, uh, then there's a lot of interesting things that can be done in, uh, in IP with a bit of uh, future thinking. So if you've got some uh, IP in place, I, the final point I want to make is just around the importance of uh, communicating um, your IP to various stake or, uh, stakeholders uh, uh, within or outside your organization uh, and using uh, those um, conversations to right size your IP strategy. So uh, one uh, little tool uh, I like uh, to see clients use is sort of, they may have a couple of patents and a bunch of claims there and they may have some other IP rights, but sort of putting all that into a matrix and correlating the features that have been claimed in a patent, for example, with uh, the features uh, that they have launched or are launching in uh, future products. And when stakeholders from marketing or uh, regulatory um, product development, <coughs> excuse me, product development or finance, are really across uh, the depth of what you're doing in IP, um, it's easy to get uh, inputs from them that are, are sensible and help you right size the process. And sometimes um, our clients are doing a bit more than is necessary in terms of filings. Maybe um, ge geographically, they're going a bit harder than they need to. Uh, but other times and quite often, there's a real opportunity for um, IP protection, something that they've spent a lot of time on uh, and they haven't even uh, got a, uh, basic protection in key jurisdictions. So that's important. 
Okay. And that gets me to the end of the slides. That's good, Chris. Uh, great work. We've got some, some questions um, coming through here, which is good. And um, if, you've, if you've got anything you'd like uh, to throw uh, at Chris, uh, feel free to throw it in the in the Q&A box now. Um, I'll kick you off with, with one, Chris. So I've got a, a competitor that's got a, a, you know, some, some IP protection, perhaps a patent um, that I'd like to get around. Um, yes. I changed my, my uh, competitive product by, you know, say 15% compared to their product. That'll, that'll get me around that, will it? <laughs> well, we've got to really uh, look at what the claims of their uh, patent are and what, what stage their patent application is up to. So if they've got a granted patent, uh, then, then their claims are effectively, uh, the, the scope of the protection is sort of locked in. And we can then uh, do what's called an infringement analysis to determine whether there's infringement or not. And sort of <laughs> 10 or 15% uh, rule, which we hear from time to time, uh, it's not really relevant at all. The question is whether uh, what you're doing uh, uh, ticks off the integers of their claims, which is a bit, bit technical, I know, but uh, there's basically a legal analysis that determines whether there's infringement or not. Now, if you want to, uh, but you know, often uh, you mentioned getting around a competitor's uh, patent and that's, um, that's uh, uh, always a lot of fun <laughs> and, uh, uh, sort of an attorney can help you uh, figure out what options there might be uh, in consultation with your writing creative minds. That's good. That's good. Get a couple of questions coming through on innovation patents. So you mentioned they're being they're being disbanded in, in three weeks. So what do you think is the is the reasoning behind that? Um, the decision to do that, and and what does the what does the change in regime look like? in particular for existing innovation patents? So for, for existing innovation patents, there's there's no change. It's all just sort of uh, grandfathered. Um, but for, uh, it's the, it the 25th of um, August, 25th or 26th, uh, uh, is the final date on which new innovation patents can be filed. So uh, why, why are they doing it? Uh, I think IP Australia came to the conclusion, uh, sort of contrary to the experiences of a lot of uh, IP attorneys in Australian SMEs, that uh, they, they were sort of primarily a tool of large corporates. Uh, and look, we've seen them, we've seen them uh, heavily used by corporates, but we have seen them heavily used by SMEs. And particularly, you know, if, if you're, uh, if your invention is an incremental improvement on uh, a current product, uh, the improvement is new, uh, but it's also probably obvious. You can, you can get an innovation patent for that. Uh, so long as you're coming up with new functional features and you know, it's got a, a commensurately uh, short term of eight years. So we've, we've thought uh, our observation has been, they've been a pretty good tool for, um, for Australian SMEs. It's good, it's good. A couple of questions coming through, really, I guess, um, around the expense, the, the, the cost and the effort um, of, of filing a patent um, and whether it's worth it. Can you just give us some general commentary around um, the, the expenses relating to the filing of patents? Yeah, look, um, patent, patents aren't for all ideas. Uh, uh, and you, I think you've got to look at the question of whether it's worthwhile filing IP. And, and we'll talk a little bit about cost as well in a moment, um, through two different lenses, at least. Um, uh, the first lens is the likelihood of validity. Uh, and the second, you know, you make a filing, what's the likelihood it's going to get through to grant. Um, and the second lens is what's the uh, commercial value importance of the claims that are going to be filed. Uh, and it's really in the middle of that, say, Venn diagram uh, is where the, you know, where, where the real value lies. Uh, now, in terms of costs, uh, I'll probably start by just giving a really high level on the process for patenting. And 
Um, we'll just stick with payments for now. Uh, so you normally start with a, <coughs> excuse me, a provisional patent application uh, and that lasts for 12 months. And then if you're looking at international markets, you might then file what's called a PCT international patent application. That goes for uh, a further 18 months after your first 12 months. And then there's opportunities for choosing which countries you, you wish to uh, complete the patent application process in. So, and costs during each of those stages sort of uh, increase from one stage to the next. Uh, and part of the way the system's developed is to push costs back in time. So having said all that, so provisional patent applications may come in somewhere between five and $10,000. Uh, and in particular, if we're talking sort of uh, physical products, me mechanical technologies, um, and maybe sort of more basic electrical technologies. Um, and then uh, P a PCT international patent application process, uh, which is not the only option for the second stage, but it's a typical option, uh, filing might cost $12,000. Uh, and the rest of that process, there's some thousands of dollars there, depending on uh, so what, what options you choose during that process. Uh, but, you know, overall, um, if you're looking at filing in Australia, um, what, say United States uh, and uh, Europe, say that, or China, um, then you, you're sort of budgeting costs for whole of, um, process between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars. That's good. That's good. So I've got a couple of specific questions here um, in relation to that. So um, I've got a patent on my product, with only a very small uh, feature that is different from the other products in the market. Um, can it be very difficult and expensive uh, process for protection in that scenario? So it's 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 interesting the. Uh, an invention, there was some case law a long time ago that, that said only a scintilla of, uh, or scintilla of invention is required. Uh, uh, so that the actual feature, so long as it meets these two requirements that it's functionally different, it's new, uh, and it's not obvious to someone who's skilled in the art, uh, then uh, you know, they're the two main requirements for patenting in pretty much every country around the world. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, so again, I go back to that Venn diagram <coughs> is the question of whether you can get a patent on it is not the only relevant question. We've got to also ask, say we do get, um, we, we can uh, protect that feature, then how does it, how's that going to likely affect margin over one year, three years, five years, uh, or, you know, are there licensing opportunities uh, outside of our normal business operations? So sort of always got to look at those two things together. That's good. Um, I'm going to merge a couple of questions here together. Um, so one is, um, what would you say about design registering a proprietary aluminium extrusion, um, consequently opening up overseas suppliers to view it uh, and copy the profile um, where we would not waste the resources to pursue it? Um, the second question I think probably ties into that to some extent. And that is, what do we say as to the uh, as to the view that if I file for IP protection, that I'm opening up my special source um, mm. or secret for viewing? Mm. Okay, terrific. Yeah, they are connected. Uh, so with the aluminium extrusion, uh, uh, as uh, as is pointed out. Uh, that extrusions, extrusions are often protected by registered designs. And uh, I guess, I guess one, one of the sort of initial questions I'd have is to what extent, so a registered design is published uh, within a period of weeks and once it's filed, and that makes uh, your design uh, public knowledge. Uh, so I guess that you know, and then the question is around to what extent is that a risk? Well, uh, I would ask, you know, is it, is it likely that uh, your overseas competitor is going to find out about your extrusion cross-section uh, uh, 
irrespective of whether they learn about it uh, through your design registration publication or not. Now, if they're going to learn about it anyway, better to get the 10 years of protection. And, um, you know, even, uh, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, 10, 10 years is a long time, right? So they may not, you may be able to sort of keep it secret from them for six months or a year, but what's the likelihood you're going to keep it secret for more than 12 months or 24 months? I'm not sure because um, I don't know your business, but uh, uh, designs are relatively inexpensive for sort of $2,000 mark, say. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, without knowing more information, it's hard to say, uh, but I think an important question is to what extent would they find out anyway? Um, and then the next question was... Uh, was it around filing? Alistair, could you just help me out? Yeah, it was. I think you've probably you've probably covered it off. It was really around um, exposing that that special source um, or trace ah, yes. that perhaps um, you know, might not yet be visible. Yeah, um, yeah. I think you've probably answered it in saying that that um, if it's if it's going to become visible, um, then there's no there's not really any downside to it. But otherwise, I guess we've got to toss up the pros and cons, don't we? Yeah, most, most products are reverse engineerable. Uh, the, I think the space where we encourage clients to sort of uh, lean more on the secret source is in software, uh, where you're sort of part of your operation is within a black box. Uh, because there, other than through breach of uh, confidence of one of your employees, say, or a contractor, um, it is very difficult uh, for someone to figure out how you're doing it. Having said that, we file a lot of payments on uh, software, so um, and a lot of software is reverse engineerable in terms of how it works. That's good. That's good. I've got one that's um, slightly slightly left field here, but um, so I enter into a, a, an NDA, non disclosure agreement, or a confidentiality agreement, um, or or uh, somebody else, you might say, does in relation to me disclosing some information about my business or some of my IP. What yes. protection does that give me? So we've got non-disclosure protection. But what protection does that give me to the recipient? Um, you might say of that of that information. What protection? Well, it may not give any. Uh, so in a, a non-disclosure agreement, you've got a disclosure and a disclosee. If it's a one-way uh, non-disclosure agreement, then it does nothing for the disclose, uh, a disclosee other than create an obligation. But um, for the disclosure, it can provide protection to the extent that you can identify and trace a breach of confidentiality of it. So the problem with non-disclosure agreements is, um, uh, you know, say, uh, you have some uh, very important confidential information you want to disclose to me and say I'm a bit of a crook um, and I want to use that uh, information in some dodgy way. Well, I could go tell a third party who you don't know about that information and they could uh, publish that information on a blog, again, that you don't know, um, maybe even I don't know, online. And that, that information then becomes part of the public knowledge to the extent that breach can't be traced. And by that information becoming part of the sort of public body of knowledge, it then precludes you filing a patent application on it in the future. So non-disclosure agreements um, you know, should, should be used, uh, but in terms of, uh, they're, they're not a, I guess, replacement for patent design or trademark protection for that matter. That's good, that's good. So another one here, is there an easy way to protect the photos or images um, on our website? Oh, that's a good question. Probably, pro probably, more goes to, probably more goes to copyright. That's not an area of expertise of mine. So, um, you know, what could I say about that? Uh, yeah, no, it'd be a good question for a, a, a a solicitor. Mm. 
That's good. That's good. We'll move on. Um, all right. Here's a here's a relatively straightforward one. At what point should a brand name uh, or business logo be be registered? Okay. Yeah. Good question. Uh, so, unlike patents or registered designs that need to be filed before a uh, before the uh, product is a sort of uh, launched uh, or made public. Uh, there is a grace period uh, for each of them, but the general rule is filed before you uh, make make it public. Uh, trademarks can be filed at any point in time. Now, uh, look, if, if you have the sort of $1,000 or $2,000 to file a trademark registration early on, it's normally well worthwhile because uh, you sort of, you're simply going to have an enforceable right sooner. Uh, and it's much, much easier to enforce a registered uh, trademark uh, or to stop someone using a confusingly similar mark um, if you have a registered trademark as opposed to relying on unregistered rights. So having, I mean, having said that, if, um, if the funds are not available, um, you know, maybe you're working towards a, a capital raise or, or something and plan to file your trademark after that, then uh, you can you can file at any time. And one thing uh, that I guess works in your favour uh, about filing a trademark application later on is that uh, there's more you have more evidence of use, uh, more evidence that the market recognises your uh, trademark, and that can actually help the filing go through the registration. That's good. That's good. Uh, we've got a question here. Um, might be outside. Uh, your area, but the uh, the best strategy when when we've got um, entities in different countries um, in the same business, both generating IP, um, who to own uh, that IP uh, or has that IP. Um, I guess from my perspective, that's going to go uh, further than just the protection of it. Uh, we've got some some opens up some complex questions around what the uh, what the future plans of the business are and, and perhaps the exit plans, tax considerations and so on. But what would you say, Chris? Sorry, is it I just want to clarify the question. So is this, um, are these related entities or? Yes, so I, I, I understand they're related entities, essentially mm -hmm. in, the, in the same business, but operating in different countries. And um, where, to hold, where to hold the IP, right? Yes, yes with both entities theoretically generating uh, some IP, where to, where to house it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess uh, tax is a big consideration and that goes to the tax law of the two jurisdictions and what uh, treaties may exist uh, between them. It goes to transfer pricing arrangements. Uh, if both entities need to use the IP, it'd be, say, held in an entity in one country and licensed to your uh, related entity in the other country. <coughs> uh, you know, I, IP... Um, uh, patents, trademarks, designs, they're all national rights. So uh, enforcement would always need to be in the relevant jurisdiction anyway. So um, that doesn't really uh, play into where it's held so much because, you know, you can hold a US patent uh, in an Australian entity. There's no, nothing precluding you doing that. I think, it, I think the question would mainly, I think the you mainly be wanting to look at tax. Yep. Not yeah. something I know a lot about. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I think I, I would agree with that and I would add on to that. I think it really brings up what the, in particular, what the, what the if there is an exit plan uh, for the business, so we intending to, to move the business on, mm -hmm. um, you know, sell it out uh, at a future date. Um, I think you have to look at the tax regimes uh, for the different countries and understand what those likely outcomes um, are going to be. That will very much, it should very much drive some of that decision making. Yeah, that's good. Um, just, um, just, just reverting back, just quickly to the to the the innovation patents. Um, so once the innovation patents go, um, what's the what's the alternative? We just back what, to the what's patent. left. <laughs> well, in Australia, what's left are standard patents and designs. So that's the twenty year patent and the 10 year registered design. There are, in some other countries like Germany, there's a, a patent called the utility model, which is very similar, well, 
has similarities to the Australian innovation payment system. So if you're talking about protection in another country, sometimes there are uh, will be some second tier options that might not have the same inventive step uh, thresholds that their standard patents would. Uh, but yeah, in, in Australia, uh, we sort of, uh, with standard patents, then come back to this criteria of uh, features need, needing to be new and not obvious to someone skilled in the art. That's good. That's good. Um, I've got a specific question here. Uh, somebody imports a, a particular product um, from China, silicon lid. The IP is owned uh, by a company in France. Um, it's a unique design item with significant IP. Uh, the French owner is reluctant to try and protect his IP because it's so expensive. Um, last year, uh, they had a really big competitor copy the item exactly, um, except a lower quality and, and much lower in price. Uh, is there anything this particular business can do in this situation? So it depends what stage the IP is up to. If it is pre what we call national phase stage. So if we're talking about patents here, let's just assume we're talking about patents to start off with. Um, if it's uh, sort of less than, if they've gone down the PCT route and it's less than 31 months uh, into the process, then uh, you could uh, negotiate with the French company uh, to uh, obtain the right to file the national phase application in Australia. Uh, now, if it's beyond that sort of, <coughs> excuse me, period of time, uh, then it gets tricky uh, because within the patent process, there are uh, set sort of time-based stage gates uh, after which uh, your, your geogra geographical options um, uh, either diminish uh, or end. Uh, and uh, without... So engaging the PCT process, uh, Australian application can be filed within 31 months of the initial filing. Uh, otherwise, the Australian application would need to be filed within 12 months of the initial filing. That's good, that's good. Um, I get a question here from, from earlier. Um, it's relating to perhaps coming back to the, to the capturing and maintaining of, of um, IP uh, internally. Yes. Um, how is it best to, to uh, what would you say about maintaining an IP uh, register um, and the, the uh, I guess, the, uh, the benefits of that internally? I mean, I think it's, obviously, I think it's an excellent idea because uh, at the very least, it means you're uh, thinking about what IP rights you have and what needs to be done to maintain them. One of the, um, once you, I mean, once you have a granted patent, then, uh, maintenance is primarily relates to just keeping it renewed. Um, but with trademarks, it's quite different. Uh, with trademarks, it's important uh, to a couple of things. So firstly, as you're using your brands, you need to keep using them as trademarks and not revert to using them in a descriptive way, even if they become really popular. So um, for example, I mean, that, you know, big example here in Australia is the Ugg Boots, right? Uh, became, it was once a brand and uh, then uh, quickly became the generic descriptor of uh, for sheepskin boots here in Australia. Now it's not the, not the case in the States. In the States, it, it is still functioning as a brand. But here in Australia, it's owned by Decca Corporation. But in Australia, uh, so whatever your brand is, if, um, uh, and sort of uh, particularly become, becomes really popular, you wanna make sure that you're always using it as a brand. So let's think of an example. Um, oh, Tiger, what was it called? Tiger uh, kayak uh, trailers. Say they became really popular and people just started referring to trailers with this feature as tigers. Yeah, did you bring your tiger today? <laughs> it sounds crazy, but you know, it would have sounded crazy calling vacuum cleaners uh, hoovers perhaps uh, once upon a time um, or, or uh, Esky is the other example. Uh, so uh, which are, you know, uh, which are maintained trademarks here in Australia, although they were at risk from uh, the genericide is what we call it. So 
Uh, very important with the trademarks, always uh, in this example, Tiger Kayak Trailer. Tiger, brand, kayak trailer, descriptor. Always use your brand with a descriptor of your product or service. So that's the first thing. And just auditing how your team are using your trademarks on a regular basis um, is very helpful. Um, it's also important if you've got a bit of a sort of corporate structure that has a few different levels uh, and you might have all the trademark registrations uh, owned within a holding company. So as I mentioned before, nicely hived away from the operational entities. Um, it's important that the relevant uh, license agreements are in place for the uh, related entities uh, to be allowed to use them. Um, otherwise, your trademark uh, applications are not being used by the owner of the trademarks and are vulnerable to be um, knocked off the register for non-use. So good. there, yeah, a few important things to think about in maintaining intellectual property. Yeah, one of the areas that we haven't uh, covered off in, in much detail, Chris, but I've I come across it quite a bit um, and I think is, is quite important. So is that perhaps the, uh, the non, you might say the, the non-registrable types of IP um, and a process for identifying where the value sits um, in, in those areas in, in my business. Yes. And to maintain some protections around that. So an example that I, um, I guess, comes to my mind, um, that a project-based business that are very um, complex or convoluted um, estimating slash quoting model um, and, and built some, um, you know, quite an extensive um a costing tool, um, Excel based, but put a lot, you know, many thousands of hours of development into it. Um, very valuable. Um, mm, indeed. And they hadn't given it much thought as to where the value of that sat and hadn't put any internal protections around it. What would you say in situations like that? Well, that's where, that's, I guess, yeah, a few things. That's where your IP register comes in. So is it identified uh, as a piece of IP? Is it, is your IP register are referred to specifically in uh, employment agreements uh, to the extent that employees will have access to relevant parts of that register. Uh, that's also something to consider because you really, you know, big part of this is just communicating with your team in a really, really clear way and, and in writing um, what you consider to be your IP. And, you know, this is, this is not just a, uh, calculation tool that is a better way for, uh, sorry, pricing tool, was it? Um, it's a better way for an industry to price this type of thing. No, this is your proprietary uh, uh, IP and technology uh, that's um, uh, integral to how your business performs and, and, and your competitive advantage. And it's very important that that's made clear um, in the agreements that you have with your uh, employees and any contractors who have access to it. That's good. That's good. Another quick question here. What's the best way to protect a manufacturing process? Oh, um, using a patent. Yeah. So patents can be used to protect products or processes and they're regularly used to protect uh, new and not obvious manufacturing processes. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, often when we think about patents, we're just thinking about products, but uh, uh, sort of two, say, really broad types of patent claims are uh, claims to product or apparatus or devices and claims to processes. And as a matter of interest, uh, a lot of software, um, software patents have a lot of claims to processes, processes performed by servers or various actors or entities. Good. Um, when can you use or not use a series trademark application? Uh, you got me on that. So <laughs> I, got, I wish I had one of my trademark people here. Um, I'm mainly a patent guy myself. Uh, I, I, I would have to get back. I'll get back to you on that. That's good. That's good. Um, finally, uh, what protections can be put in place whilst an invention is in development phase and not ready to be filed at that point in time? Okay. Well, I, the first thing I think is be careful who it's disclosed to and, and be certain that it, it 
doesn't, you know, hit the internet or um, doesn't become public knowledge because that could preclude filings in, well, uh, certain jurisdictions straight away uh, or in other jurisdictions beyond uh, a grace period. Um, so being very careful about where that information gets to is the first thing. And then secondly, uh, you know, anyone who has exposure to that information should only have exposure to it under an agreement. Now that might be an employment agreement, a contracting agreement with IP clauses in it, uh, and uh, non, a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and one other thing to be careful of in these type of situations is you might disclose uh, an idea with features sort of A and B to someone else. Um, but that then prompts them to think of feature C. So what happens in that type of situation? Well, uh, when you're engaging people in sort of thinking, uh, brainstorming, product improvement sort of processes, it's important to the extent that you can uh, to have uh, an assignment agreement in place with them, uh, you know, prior to or uh, or prior to preferably the discussion, but otherwise immediately afterwards, making sure the IP they come up with is assigned to the entity where you wanted to land. That's good. That's good. Um, I think we're we're almost out of time. Probably room for for two more questions. Um, if the process in manufacturing is protected by a patent, um, but my process is different, but achieves the same result, uh, the question is: I'm not infringing the patent, am I? Correct. You're not infringing the patent. Yeah. If you're if you're if patent if the patent says the process has steps A, B, C, D, and E and you're doing A, B, C, and E, not doing D, you're not infringing the patent. That's good, that's good. So we'll probably finish off uh, on this one. Uh, registered a business name several years ago or, or, and also trademarked it. Things changed, haven't actually traded with it. Uh, overseas company trying to register in Australia, um, demanding a transfer of the trademark as they have used the brand name uh, in Australia before we have, can they do this? Right, so are they, so I, I guess it depends what mechanism they're using. There's a, a th and depends on when the trademark was filed. There's a five year uh, non-use uh, 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 sort of action that someone can take against a trademark that hasn't been used. That was recently uh, changed to a three year uh, requirement. So uh, registrations filed on or after the 24th of February, 2019. Um, uh, there's a companies only have a period of three years from the date on which the mark is entered on the register before it becomes vulnerable to an application for non-use. So, um, I thought, so, uh, look, I don't, I don't know the timing of this, uh, particular situation, but that, you know, this is the issue is this provision. Um, uh, I guess we just want to look very carefully to see, has there been any use at all? Have you filed a domain name, uh, for example? Um, you know, is there any, uh, anything that you can show in terms of sort of prep, uh, steps in preparation that you've taken uh, to prepare to use the trademark? So it may not be sales, it may not be invoices, um, but are there other things you've done in the background to prepare? And uh, some of those things might save you from um, this non-use action. That's good. That's good. Well, I think we've uh, pretty much used up our full hour. Uh, so I think we're going to have to place further questions on the notice paper, as the saying goes. Um, really appreciate everybody's time today. Appreciate your time, Chris. Uh, trust um, being able to, to deliver some value. Um, there will be a quick questionnaire pop up uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. Appreciate if it could be filled out. Um, other than that, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again for your time. Thank you.